you for having us. Uh, today we're going to be talking about is your dam working for you? Um, my name is Josh Van Dyke and uh, we're going to speak with some extra gusto today, right Chris? Because it is late in the afternoon for some of you and maybe even in the evening for those of you in Europe. I know some of you maybe need that extra cup of coffee so we will be the virtual coffee right now. Um, and <clears throat> today we're going to be talking a little bit about is your dam working for you? Uh, as mentioned, my name is Josh Van Dyke. I oversee our uh, North American sales team and our solution consultants team. Uh, Chris, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thanks, Josh. Happy to be here. Uh, excited to be presenting with you again and excited to be back at one of these events. So I'm Chris Lehman, the Vice President of Solution Architecture for Emsphere Plus. Emsphere Plus is an end-to-end -end, uh, partner that's able to work with you on uh, from consulting to picking out a dam, working on implementation, uh, custom development, and everything that goes forward for uh, uh, support and managed services at the end. Uh, personally, I've been working in the dam industry for almost 10 years now uh, across many different uh, dam solutions. Awesome. So what are we going to be covering today? Uh, in this session, you're really going to learn about, you know, what are some of those common challenges we see in organizations that signal outgrowth? What are some of the questions you need to ask yourself internally, uh, as well as ask vendors so that may, you're making sure you're solving those challenges and not just getting wooed by a sexy demo. Uh, and then what are some of those major things you need to be bringing up to your management in a business case to make sure you're getting buy-in from that C-suite? Today, we've broken this down into three different sections, uh, asset management and protection challenges, technical challenges, and some of those intangibles. So a good question to ask yourself is, where are we at right now? Right. Some, some of you on this call may be just using Box or Google Drive or a local file system. As David Lipsy said this morning, those are not real dams. But if you're on this call and you have that situation, you're going to learn a lot today. Um, <clears throat> some of you have a dam that you're already seeing that you're starting to outgrow. You've been with it a year and a half or two years. You're starting to add some additional business units or acquire new companies. And you're saying, man, we're starting to outgrow this. In that case, you're in the right place, okay? So <clears throat> in terms of this presentation, we've broken this down into some of the challenges you're gonna see uh, in your organization and some of the solutions and questions you'd be asking. So in terms of asset management and protection, searchability and findability is a big one. Now, Chris, I know that this seems like something that might be simple or rudimentary, but it's still a problem with a lot of light dams. Maybe you can expand a little bit on that. It's something that comes up all the time. It doesn't do you any good to have your assets in a system if you can't find them uh, by searching or if you're just really stuck finding the same things over and over people are going to keep re-uploading and adding the same things and you're going to run into all kinds of problems so what you need to find out is what kind of search technology do you have on the back end is it like a graph database is it a sql database is there a database to be able to find out any of these things um, not only that or what fields are used for being able to do the search can they be extended uh, can you also index them so that'll make the search faster so that you can do your custom fields, but indexing them so that you can start using, you know, some logic to find things ahead of time. But then also, um, can you search the content of assets? Like your uh, enterprise dams will let you take a PDF, Word file, InDesign, and be able to actually index or scrape that content off of there so that you can actually search for that and be able to return a lot more results, uh, being a lot more flexible that way by actually getting into the content. Yeah, and that's interesting because a lot of a lot of companies we talk to don't even know that you can do that. You can actually just do a simple search within the dam and search within something like a PDF for that type of text, which is just massive. Um, you know, hey, you have a dam. Let's make sure you're utilizing it properly. Asset utilization, traceability. What are you hearing from customers when it comes to those types of topics, Chris? It's similar as in being able to search. If you have all these items in the dam, are you able to know what's being used or is anything being used? A lot of your dams will just be a repository, especially if you're using like a uh, box or something like that, which we know is not a dam, but it's just there. So you don't know if somebody has downloaded it, exported it. So you want to be able to track those informations and you'd be able to report on that or be able to at least get that information. And is it very easy to find where a specific asset is used too? So I remember when we were working with Kohl's, um, we put in a database of all of their disclaimers so that you can click on it and see everywhere it was. Before then, we had to go through and look at the actual uh, printout pages to find out, okay, which one did we have? Is it the right one there? But being able to have that relation to what is actually being used is very helpful too. Yeah, that's huge, that's huge. 
You know, one I see a lot of is this taxonomy need, right? Um, where you actually may have multiple taxonomies. So a good question to ask a vendor is, can they support multiple taxonomies? You know, the reality is, is that you may actually go ahead and add different business units to this platform later that might have different taxonomy needs. Or I was on a breakout on John's breakout and uh, a lady Lisa said, hey, we have, we've acquired five different companies with five different needs and they're all in the same dam and they, they need to have uh, flexibility around that taxonomy or different taxonomies. Also, if you've been with an organization for a few years, you see that your needs change. So is the, tax, is the taxonomy flexible once the assets are already in the dam? Um, because you want to have that flexibility within the system to make sure that you can accommodate those future needs. You know, another thing that we see a lot of is reporting. And Chris, I know you could, you could nerd out all day on reporting. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about what, what things you're seeing with reporting. Uh, reporting is huge. Um... You want to make sure that, you know, are there any out, out of the box reports that are there? But beyond that, you know, are you able to customize those reports? Because everybody's going to have different needs. They're going to have custom metadata, custom asset types, custom projects or something like that. So you want to make sure that you're not just stuck with canned reports that are just going to not give you anything that's going to, you know, help you figure out your utilization or how many assets do you have or find out the, 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 the hard facts that you have. That's going to be really good to take to the management too. But then not only is that, you know, out of the box reports, can you do custom reports? But then you don't want to be just stuck with custom reports where you have to hard code them. The best that you can find is, can you create on the fly reports? Be that from a search results, you get to choose your columns and export that out. Or even if it's tied into a separate module within the, within the system that allows you to create these reports on the fly, that's really the best that you can do. So you need to ask like, what type of reporting can you do? And it's gonna be really big to make sure you're meeting your needs. Yeah, huge, huge. Um, by the way, there's some of you on this call that are like trying to frantically jot down notes or screenshot this. We actually have a full list of these questions and answers um, that's uh, much further uh, explained upon uh, that we can actually send you. So uh, don't worry about trying to get every single detail down. It's already written down for you. You just need to email us. We'll provide you that at the end. Moving on to technical limitations. Um, one of the things that we see quite a bit of is performance issues. People coming, a lot of times people come to us at SendShare, you know, looking for that second dam and they're having that spinning beach ball all the time in that current dam, right? So why are they having that? Um, you know, so oftentimes that's a peak, it, uh, a peak time issue, right? So can things be adjusted to mitigate those performance issues in peak times? Can the system scale? to uh, or scale dynamically to meet those peak times. And, you know, oftentimes we see this, um, you know, in a maybe a single tenant versus a multi-tenant in that multi-tenant approach, there just isn't much flexibility in how you can scale out and you get that spinning beach ball. And, you know, does an, another great question to ask the vendors, do they have a distributed server network, right? Um, all well and good if all your staff is in one little spot, but today, as you know, people working remotely and, you know, some people might be in Milwaukee where Chris is, some people might be in Los Angeles where I am, and some people might be in, you know, Paris. You want to be able to have servers in each spot to make sure you're not having big lag times. Chris, in terms of archive and retention, these are big, big factors now. Maybe you could shed some light on what you're seeing out there with your, with our, with the customers. A lot of the question comes down to is, do you have a plan for archive and retention? Um, is it something that's included with the vendor? Is it something that you have on your own that you've decided? So you want to make sure that the vendor or the, the system that you want to go with has some kind of long-term storage, either built in or accessible within there. So you want to be able to have that plan. Do you want to know, is it automated? Can you change up those automations that are within there? Can you add additional things? Maybe you have um, a specific field that you want to use to key off of for archive, but that's not something that that system will accept. So you want to make sure that your plan is going to meet up with your, uh, with your vendor's plan. You also want to make sure that you're able to figure out what kind of storage cost savings you're able to get. A lot of these, especially if you're in the cloud, you go with AWS, you have some of your tiered storage that you can do so that items that aren't being accessed as much are able to be on the slower storage. So that's actually some cost savings. That's something, again, that you can take to management where you're looking at these different dams. You also wanna make sure that you're able to meet your needs for being able to get that information uh, to cold storage or into an archive, and then also get it back in. 
and make that as automated as possible so that you can make it easy for your customers or your clients to work with the, the system and also reach those cost savings. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I was actually speaking to, um, you know, a archival specialist the other day, and she was talking about how also having uh, relations in your database, having that graph database that creates relations is really helpful because seven or 10 years from now, when someone actually goes to find an asset, they don't have context around it unless that database has created the relationships to create that context, right? Um, you know, another thing that we're seeing, and, and, you know, this is always evolving, you know, it's been evolving ever since DAM started, but file type limitations. Um, you know, maybe you could uh, tell uh, our, our group here on this call a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, the biggest question that you have is, are there file type limitations within the DAM, or is it open? And you're really going to see the difference between something that of your smaller DAMs versus an enterprise level. Your enterprise level basically lets you store anything in there, lets you add in and also create new um, file types or MIME types as you need to. But some of the lesser ones are going to be restricted as to what you are able to bring in. And the question that you have with that then is, is that going to meet my needs for now, but then also for the future? Because things keep changing. And then also how often is it updated? If you have some limitations, how often are they making those adjustments? 3D, uh, 3D uh, items and AI and images, they're always changing and evolving. And you never know what's going to be there, but is that system going to keep up in the future? And is that going to be able to allow you to meet your needs? And do you even know what you're going to need too is a big question too. Yeah, totally. And you know, file types like 3D files or different things with AI, uh, really important because we're seeing that evolution. But we're also, you know, at Censure, we, we worked with Philadelphia Orchestra and they went ahead and had these really old file types from a hundred years ago. Right. So how do you accommodate that? And will a vendor actually work with you on that? Right. So uh, both sides of the coin there. A another huge one I, I see a lot at SunShare is this inability to integrate with, uh, you know, other applications very well. Right. And so one thing that's really good to ask, uh, you know, a vendor is around their their API maturity. Right. Because every vendor will say, well, yeah, sure, Chris, we can connect to this. Yeah, we, we have open APIs. They do. Um, and then you end up, you know, sometimes you're not, you're pushing or pulling a lot of information in and out of the system, you start getting throttled, you know, and, um, you know, that's, that's not what you want. Tell, tell us a little bit more about maturity of APIs and how does, how does a customer know, like, is a vendor telling the truth? Do they really have mature APIs? The biggest thing that you're going to have, because everybody's going to say that they have it, is that you need to see how well documented that API information is. What kind of examples are they? What are they able to provide to you? What kind of connections do they provide either out of the box or that you can buy or sign up for to add into that? And then how is the system set up? A lot of times, if you're on a shared uh, system, um, you're going to end up being either throttled or there's going to be only so much that that system can handle. For, whereas if you're on your own system or in the cloud or in-house, in you're going to have open uh, ability to run as many calls that you have, any different types of calls within there then too. Um, so that you need to make sure that you have the right solution uh, set up from that way too. But then also within these APIs, are they expandable? Do you have somebody that can help you do that either in-house or is it the, a vendor or a partner able to work with you? And which technology is used for that? You know, a lot of them are in REST or Java. So you're able to make exam, uh, extendable, uh, add, uh, customized extend, extensions to that on your own. Right on. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. Uh, moving on to intangibles, uh, this is my favorite section. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we see a lot of is this product roadmap and building for the future within an organization, right? And it's something that customers really need to start thinking of, um, you know, is that vi visibility into what they want to do and, and is, is the partners, is, is the vendor sharing that, right? Is feedback even welcome, Right. Uh, how often is that information going ahead and being distributed to customers around what we're doing on the product roadmap? Um, another huge one on, on product roadmap is can you build your own features? And can, can those products, can that can actually be e extended? You know, one of the things that I always think of is like product versus a platform. Oftentimes a platform uh, has a lot more flexibility in what you can do. You can actually build your own custom features. You, you know, the, the platform might have 85% of what you need, but because of your specific use case, you actually need to go ahead and, and, and build a little extra code on top of it to do the exact thing that you want. And a lot of products are really locked down um, because you have a lot of shared infrastructure. 
So really looking at a, you know, a, a platform to be able to meet your long-term needs, right? Um, you know, by the way, limited partner network is a huge sign of like product versus platform as well, right? Um, did I buy a product in a dam or did I get a platform that I can expand on? If they have a really limited partner network, um, they probably are a product because most things are just out of the box. So what do you need partners for? But Chris, you're a partner. Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, having your partner is going to be a big thing. But not only that is like, you want to make sure that the partner network is the larger the partner network, the more choices that customers are going to have so that you're not going to just have one partner that's doing the exact same thing for every person. You have the ability to find people that maybe are better in retail or better in print publishing. So you have different options within there too. You want to make sure that the company has the information to not only know the product, but also to know what you're doing as the client. So you want to make sure that they can understand you and then also understand how you're going to use the product because you don't want to just have them giving you the exact same thing that they did for somebody else because your needs could be completely different. So you wanna make sure that you have the options with a partner to be able to work hand in hand um, with the implementation and then continuing on. That leads into the next one here too, is there's a lot of times where you have problems with support and user adoption. And a lot of times you see this when you're not having a partner that's there working with you. So you wanna make sure that your partner is able to provide more support, on-demand support. Um, what kind of support are they able to offer? Can they provide you with custom support? Is it, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is it defined how they're gonna handle support between the first level, third level, second level, so that you know who exactly you need to go to when you're having a problem? And also when you're working with your partner, are you able to work hand in hand to say if you have some usage um, adoption challenges, how are they gonna work with you to get through those? Uh, can they offer additional training? Can they do listening sessions on those challenges and help you solve them? And then also work through process changes with you hand in hand. And having a good partner is really important for that. Yeah, no, huge. Um, you know, one of the last ones on the intangibles that I think is so important is this limited to pure DAM functionality. And you're seeing this a lot in, in Henry Stewart topics too, talking about content hub and things of that nature. So when you're looking at an organization, do you have larger needs outside of just DAM? Because there's a lot of things that tie in with DAM, like product information management or campaign management or print production management. Um, you know, so again, are you taking a tactical approach where you're just trying to solve a pesky business problem? Uh, we need to find our assets. So let's get a dam, right? Uh, or are you taking a strategic approach and looking at, hey, is, is maybe more of a content hub a better fit for our organization as we grow and evolve into the organization that we want to be over the next three and five years? So looking for a platform that actually provides uh, more than just simple functionality. All right, a few key takeaways. Where are you at right now? Great question to always ask your organization. What is the maturity level of my organization and the dam that we're on? Um, you know, do we want a product, something to solve the pesky business problem, or do we need a platform? Do we want to look longer term? Do we have a larger vision? Um, you know, will we need more features as we grow? Are we going to need things outside of DAM with, you know, with PIM or MRM or, or print production? Um, are we going to need additional help or support and not just in the implementation, but maybe in helping pick out a vendor? Um, maybe we need some subject matter experts to help give us some guidance. Um, maybe you need to speak to somebody like a, like a Chris Lehman. You know, do we have the right facts to present to management? Uh, it's really easy in the damn world to kind of get caught up in, oh, well, we can create efficiencies, but that's not always what, you know, the C-level uh, wants to hear about. Sometimes they want to hear more about hard numbers, right, Chris? Oh, yeah, exactly. And we called out a couple of places where you can get those hard numbers, but you need to think beyond just, okay, we can limit headcount because that's not necessarily always going to be what they're looking for. Maybe you can say like, hey, we can move some people around to make things work better, or we can not have to lean on um, freelance staff at certain times, but also maybe we can take this process to get this, uh, this flyer out down from 16 weeks to 12 weeks, or we can produce this email in two weeks. So that means we can increase the volume with this, or we can get more personalization in what we're doing on marketing. Those are going to be some of the key facts that they really want to hear. Yeah, huge. And, you know, I know you've helped teams build out those, you know, those uh, business cases to help present to management as well. So we'd love to chat with you. 
All right. So if you're sitting here and going, gosh, that was a lot to take in in 20 minutes. I agree. And that's why we have the full list of questions. There's a lot more questions actually on the list that you should be asking yourself and vendors than what we covered here today. Uh, so feel free to just email us. Our emails are right there at the bottom. We can provide you with a copy of that. Uh, we'd love to chat with you further and have a, you know, a virtual coffee with you uh, and learn more about your use case. Of course, the coffee is, is not virtual. It's just a, a Starbucks gift card. But you know, honestly, let's, let's have a conversation. Where are your assets? Where's your culture? What do you want to do? Where do you want to go from you know, today to in the future? You know, we talked a lot about a, a lot of common business uh, problems and challenges today, but you might also have some of your own unique challenges that you want to discuss and get a, a second or a third pair of eyes on and talk about what's the best practice and how to handle that. 